Hello, we are the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health, or ACAM for short. Thank you, Matt. Hello, everyone. I'm Andre from the Mental Health. Uh, my pronouns are he and him, and I'm your chair for this CAMS campfire this evening or this afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, first things first, we want to find out a little bit about you. So there's a poll that's just popped up on your screen. Tell us which of these boxes best matches you. We don't like to put people in boxes here at CAMS campfire, but it's nice to get a sense of who's in the room. So fill in this poll for us. It's lovely to see so many of you joining us. And as Matt says, do please introduce yourselves in the chat and tell us a little bit about yourselves. And yeah, share what you're thinking as we go along in the Zoom chat as well. So we'll just give it a few more seconds and then hopefully Matt will show us the results of that poll and we'll get a sense of who the 200 or so people in a webinar are. And we'll be asking you another poll later on. We've got on. a bit of a, uh, bit of a time lag here. Sorry, a bit of a time lag. So I do encourage people to um, fill in that poll. Okay, I'll carry on while people are doing that. And Matt, we can start the introductions. Um, so yes, as Matt says, we've got a really, we've got a really good panel um, of people joining us today. I'm just going to briefly introduce everyone. So you know who's here in the webinar. Uh, we have Akgar. Uh, Dr. Akgar Gasabian. Um, I should just say, first of all, we've got the most difficult to pronounce group of people uh, in terms of names ever in a webinar. So apologies in advance, Akgar, if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. Um, she's an epidemiologist from New York, from the University School of Medicine. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us. Really looking forward to talking to you about your paper. Uh, we also have Julio, Dr. Julio uh, Vacariso Serrano. He's a psychiatrist from the West London NHS Trust. Uh, and we've got the results now of the poll. So let's just have a quick look at those and then come back to the introductions. So as per usual, we've got a real mix of people here. Uh, lots of different types of health professional, um, people from social work and education, people with research backgrounds, um, we've got some carers and family members and students. So thank you very much for filling that in. Lovely to see a good mix of people. I think uh, education professionals seem to be the main group here in the room today. So that's really good to hear. Uh, so then just carrying on with our introductions, we have, uh, as I say, research expertise from Akgar, clinical expertise from Julio, who's now here. Hi, Julio. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we've got lived experience expertise here today from Kit Morgan. Hi, Kit. Lovely to see you. Uh, they are a 22-year-old biology graduate currently living in London. And we also have some critical appraisal expertise from Douglas, who some of you may uh, remember from previous webinars. Uh, and other members of the team here today, Elisabeth and Leanne, who are looking after the chat here in Zoom and also live tweeting the webinar. So if Twitter is your thing, then please do get involved in that as well. The hashtag is CAMS Campfire uh, and Leanne will be live tweeting as we go along today. So let's make a start, shall we? This is a very exciting, uh, interesting topic to cover and we don't have very much time. We've got 55 minutes, so I'm sure we're going to be challenged in terms of focusing on everything we need to. I wanted to start very broadly for, for those of you um, who um, are perhaps new to this subject or aren't too clued up about what gender diversity is and what it means. So Kit, um, maybe we could start by asking you, what, what does, as a lived experience expert here in the room, what does gender diversity mean to you? Um, so gender diversity is obviously it's very complicated subject a lot of people don't know all the ins and outs of it I don't even um, I would say gender diversity is to me it's natural it's inherent to people's experiences like everyone has a different relationship with their gender like I've never met a single person who can describe their gender in the same way and that's true for people who aren't transgender or non-binary like um, it's just a very natural part of people um, gender is very social based and you know it's all up to interpretation so I think that it's a wonderful thing that gender diversity is now like a topic to be discussed for young people um, 
you know, I think understanding where you feel with your own gender helps you understand a lot about yourself and where you fit in the world. So, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. I think um, it's a topic that a lot of people are a little bit frightened of or a little bit worried about making mistakes with. What would your advice be to people just generally um, in terms of discussing it and learning about it? Um, for gen I think a lot of people are scared of offending trans and non-binary people when they talk about gender, but I think a lot of trans people have quite tough skin, like we're not going to get offended very easily. Um, I think as long as you come to discussion with a place of respect, you know, you listen to what they have to say, you kind of try and learn as much as you can. It's okay to ask questions, you know, but as long as it's not like interrogation almost. <laughs> just to come from a place of mutual respect and mutual understanding and you know will help you learn thank you well let's try and do that today and let's say that the discussion um both here in the webinar and in the chat and on twitter is um approached by people in that spirit so Akka, i want to ask you first of all about the relationship between gender diverse young people and mental health problems. Um, do you think gender diverse young people are more at risk of mental health problems than other young people? Thanks, Andre. Yeah, I, I think that's at least what data tells us. Um, for long, we were really focused on, on um, referral clinics and transgender clinics. So we were looking at kids that they were referred by someone and. Uh, data from those clinics suggest that um, outcomes like suicidality, distress, they're, they're more common uh, in uh, transgender, among transgender or gender non-conforming uh, individuals. Uh, now we are really expanding that to the general population because we realize that we might not always see these kids in, uh, in the transgender clinic because, because um, now we know that, you know, they, they, the spectrum of gender is much uh, broader than what we thought. And that's why we are more sensitive. We try to look into that in the general population and data from, at least from Western countries, we have very limited data from general population, but from very few studies, we see that, we see these, uh, these kids are at, at greater risk of having more mental health problems. Why um, at least, our study didn't look into the reason for that, but I think that's an opening to look for other factors. Like what, why, what, why is, what is the reason? Yeah, I know that on the mental health website that I edit, we've covered lots of research looking at the links between LGBTQ plus, you know, broadly population and mental illness. And certainly over the last five years or so, there's been a lot of studies that have demonstrated that link and it makes sense doesn't it because the the stigma and discrimination that you experience if you are gender diverse is great and that happens at a time often when you're going through adolescence or young adulthood and we know already that youth mental health is on the increase in that population so you're just adding to the potential stresses and issues um, I sometimes wonder whether we need research that demonstrates the link because it's just obvious, isn't it, that there's going to be an increase. <laughs> but um, before we get on to that, Julio, tell us a bit about what we're doing currently, do you think, in the UK? Yes. In terms of providing services for young people. Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I am quite nervous, I have to speak, because I, although I'm very happy to be here, I wasn't expecting 230 participants, which is amazing, but it's also quite <laughs> scary. So, um, yeah, sorry, what was your question? <laughs> I'm, I'm interested in, um, as, a, as a practicing clinician, um, as somebody who's interested in LGBTQ plus young people and providing care, what you think we have in terms of UK mental health services specifically for that group? Yes, well, as far as I know, we don't have 
of many resources within the the NHS NHS system. The, there is this um, the sorry I forgot now the name. <coughs> Apologies about that. <coughs> Sorry, the only uh, the only service within the NHS uh, addressing LG, uh, LGBTQ mental health is the Gender Identity Development Service at the Tavistock Hospital, but it's a national, uh, a specialized national service, but it's through this primarily focus uh, for transgender people. And in order on how to address uh, the gender spectrum within uh, camps. I know that there are some policies, but uh, I'm afraid that they are not country wide, they are not uh, a national policies, and sometimes the decision uh, to implement those policies depends on the on the trust. And um, that is also part. Uh, this is part of the reason why there are several uh, charities, association, organization across uh, the UK, which I think uh, will be also worthy to, to, to mention and happy with uh, to, to uh, this, um, share some of them. Uh, that those associations provide, uh, that provide mental health uh, support for LGBTQ uh, people. Uh, now, I know that NHS, NHS England is working uh, with uh, a plan, is trying to develop a national uh, plan to reduce all the health in <coughs> sorry, inequalities that youth, the LGBT uh, and young people and also adults face. And um, they are trying to get, you know, more knowledge on how to improve the, not only the services and of course the access, but also in trying to educate staff in, uh, so they can also provide like a more better uh, support and, 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 and help. Thank you. That's really interesting. It's, it's, it feels like services are not yet developed in such a way that they're providing specific personalized support from young people from lgbtq plus backgrounds and that's perhaps not surprising given all the other pressures that we have on mental health services in this country and, and worldwide i imagine what's your reflection atgar on that what's happening in in the states in that regard um, I'm not on the clinical side, but what I see, at least from from the re from a researcher looking at the clinical setting, I don't think we are in a better place here either, unfortunately. And uh, depending, of course, it's in the United States, depending where you live, what access you have, you can get a good care or basically nothing, uh, especially in mental health. So I am in New York City. I work in a private um, hospital so that we, we, we at NYU we provide a holistic approach care to uh, kids particularly uh, that, that need but that doesn't mean that it translates in other parts of the country unfortunately. Yeah I'd like to share a poll now because we've got we, we had this idea that we'd like to sort of find out what how confident the audience in the webinar is today uh, Matt, can you share the second poll? Is that something that we've got available now? Wonderful. So what we're looking here, so the, sorry, the title of this poll is wrong. So just ignore where it says, has this paper changed your perspective? What we're looking for here is to find out how confident you are on a scale of one to 10, providing care or support for gender diverse young people. So one is not very confident and 10 is extremely confident. Um, and, you know, if you work in schools, this is still relevant, you know, supporting young people um, with gender diverse backgrounds. Um, if you're a therapist, if you're a CAMS professional, even if you're a family member, you know, what's your confidence at being able to do this? Um, we'll give you a few minutes to answer that. So have a think about that over the next couple of minutes and we'll come back to that. Whilst, whilst you're doing that, Kit, I wanted to turn to you and, and ask, you know, as someone who identifies as non-binary, what sort of support would you personally like to receive if you needed help with your mental health? Yeah, um, when I was kind of growing up and exploring my own identity, there wasn't anything at all. Um, I remember I came out as non-binary when I was about 15, 16. 
so quite a while ago. <laughs> um, and it was really starting to be the beginning of kind of people talking about trans and non-binary issues. So there was obviously nothing in kind of healthcare at all and struggling with your own mental health, like as a teenager and also struggling with your gender. It's like a whole whirlwind of confusion. Um, I think if personally seeing other queer people and trans people in the healthcare profession and in like therapists um, is really helpful because I think if you're struggling with those kind of issues with like LGBT and where you fit in to, in society and with your mental health, it's really valuable to have someone who understands even a little bit of that to talk to. Like I've had friends who've had therapists who are queer themselves and there's that kind of instant connection and instant understanding more likely to be a bit more, I don't know, connected with those kind of experiences. Um, just seeing other people that share the same experience as you um, or just people who've kind of experienced queer issues firsthand. So not just going in and seeing a mental health professional who's read the literature, but hasn't actually spoken to any like queer people ever. <laughs> So it's kind of they're all coming it from a theoretical knowledge, not from a personal one, and it can come off a bit strange. So I think it's just a question of, you know, seeing other queer people in the field and someone who is trying is trying to learn about those experiences, even if they struggle. You know, not everyone's perfect, but seeing someone who's actually trying to understand your experience is really valuable. Thank you. That's brilliant. So poll results are up now and it looks like the you know, majority of people are kind of grouped around four, five, six kind of confidence. Um, we've got some people who are right up at the top, that's wonderful, and some people that are right down at the bottom and that's to be expected, I think, given the situation we're currently in. So thank you very much, everyone, for sharing that. That's really interesting to see. Um, yeah, Julio, what, what's your kind of reflection on what what Kit was saying there, how well do you think we offer services for young people currently that are validating and inclusive? And I, I don't want to kind of rubbish the NHS. That's not why I'm asking the question. I'm just thinking how well you think we do this currently and what we need to do to improve. I don't think that we are doing well enough, but we are at least trying and doing better that is is, is something uh, depends on as i say the trust depends sometimes of the team the professional of course uh, i uh, i don't think that i uh, i can you know add anything else what uh, <coughs> uh kids said <coughs> sorry kids said but uh, i think it's we should just uh, work in a very basic way as we work with the, the rest of young people uh, service users that we have is uh, uh, active listening respect and knowing uh, something that kid uh, said uh, earlier i think it's, it's very important that uh, we shouldn't be afraid of not knowing everything because sometimes it's difficult uh, to know so we can just ask and it's, uh, it's like a, can be so it's a very little gesture, but can make a huge uh, difference. Uh, just trying to show yourself as, in a way, vulnerable, or that you don't have the, you know, the uh, the whole knowledge that you can just ask about pronouns, and that again, little little things can make a, a huge difference and create a, a a safe space. So, how we can, how can we improve that? Uh, again, respect, education. I think that we need also uh, training, uh, no specific training, because again, we should address uh, any kind of uh, difficulty as we are uh, treating uh, young people, regardless the gender identity, uh, regardless the orientation or sexual orientation. But uh, sometimes, yeah, uh, with education, with knowledge, of course, we are gonna um, improve improve that. And I think that from a mental health perspective, uh, psychiatry or other um, other science have done um, have been quite 
harmful in, in a way, uh, mainly, you know, in the past. So I think that we need uh, to try, you know, to, to, to compensate. It's going to be difficult, but at least trying to bring some, some comfort. We, so we need to work uh, in order to, you know, raise your voice in being active allies. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's, there's also something about, um, Akka, maybe I can put this to you. There's also something about not expecting young people to educate us as clinicians. You know, you, you're talking about asking and, um, you know, learning, but you want to get the balance right, don't you? Because it's hard enough as a young person to open up about your gender and open up about your mental health without having to then educate the person who's sat, sat in front of you about what all that means. Hey, you brought up a good point. I think I'm going to repeat what was just said, uh, what we ended with, which was, you know, first of all, we need to be allies. We might not experience the same thing, but we can be allies and we can be good allies. That's, that's one thing. But we have to be open. We have to listen. Um, we have to learn. It's also on us to, to learn. And I, I'm a researcher. So in my case, you start by saying, well, isn't it obvious? I agree with you, but sometimes creating evidence helps people like, to, to, you know, in the education part that we want. That's, that's on me to uh, put this evidence out there for people who might not be aware and remind them that, hey, look at this data. This is the data. And that's, that's why you need to listen. That's why you need, you need to learn. That's why you need to educate yourself. Um, it's, I know that it's just repeating what was said so far, but that's, these are really key issues that the more we say, you know, the more we remind ourselves that these are the steps. Yeah, absolutely. It, it feels to me like there's lots of parallels with the kind of race equity discussion that's happening at the moment in terms of individuals educating themselves about, you know, how Indeed. to be anti-racist. Um, Indeed. You can't expect to be taught that from your clients. You need to go away and do the work and, and learn yeah. about it. And I think gender diversity is an issue very much like that, where we all need to educate ourselves and read the books and watch the videos. And, you know, there's a huge amount of great material out there that we can use. Um, all right. So thank you for now. Let's turn to the paper specifically. We're going to look at Akgar's research. Um, and uh, we're going to hand over to Douglas now, who's going to do a quick presentation for us on the paper. And then we're going to discuss that in a bit of detail. And then we're going to come back to this broader conversation later on in the webinar. So, yeah, over to you, Douglas. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, everyone, uh, for a really interesting discussion so far. So we mentioned data. So we've got some data to look at. Let me just um, see if I can successfully share my screen. The video on it. You'll tell me, Andre, if that's not working. I will hit play. All good. We're not hearing anything, Douglas. How's that? No, still not hearing. No, nope, it's not working. Right. You share your video with the audio. There's a little checkbox that you need to, when you share your screen, you need to share, you need to click on the video checkbox at the same time. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I did that. Let's try that. Uh, here we go. Let's try that again. Uh, apologies. Our cohort doing? study on uh, adolescent gender diversity. This is a longitudinal <laughs> cohort study uh, of all children born between 2002 and 2006, based in the Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, and I've just showed you where on the paper these details could be pulled out. Um, they were assessed for this, uh, uh, for this study at ages 9 to 11 and again at 13 to 15. So what measurements were taken? So the researchers were interested in this case in gender diverse experience and they had two different questionnaire items that looked at that. Uh, and in terms of outcomes, we were looking at mental health symptoms across a number of different domains in quite a detailed questionnaire. Uh, they also looked at uh, uh, autistic traits uh, and looked at socioeconomic background. But for our purposes, we were interested the most in the relationship between these two variables. I think an important 
aspect of the study to pick up is that the the instruments that they used, rather the questions that they used to assess gender diverse experience, and this was defined very simply as any response to two or three or to, to one of these two questions. So uh, would you rather be treated as someone from the opposite sex? No, probably yes or definitely yes. And similarly with the ACEBA question. So I think there's probably a useful discussion to be had around uh, you know, what other measures might be helpful to understand the diversity of experience and also the, the, the timings of which people's, people's feelings might change over time. So in, in appraising the paper, we very often use this framework uh, by the Critical Appraisal Skills Programme. And this presents you with a checklist of questions just to remind you of the kind of things you need to look for when we're, 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 we're trying to assess whether um, it, it, the bias could have affected these findings. Now, helpfully, I've filled in these with my opinions and other, there may be other views out there. Uh, and so you can see in, on initial glance, there's, it's, it's a bit of a mixed picture, but I wanted to point out that under question five, have the authors identified all Im important confounding factors? Well, by the nature of this type of study, that's not possible um, because of the, uh, the, the complexity of it. And we were just looking at these two, two variables, but it would be, be helpful uh, to have more measurements uh, and over a longer period of time so that we can understand more about uh, how people's uh, gender experience might change over through those crucial years, you know, in, uh, from, from age nine onwards. However, when we, we, we look at the results, uh, the, the findings of the study were around 4.3% of the participants met that criterion. Um, uh, and the rate, the prevalence, if you like, was about double uh, with uh, people assigned female sex at birth compared with those assigned male. What we've seen is consistent, moderate, positive associations between gender variant experience and mental health symptoms. And what that means is that the more people had experienced some sort of gender variant experience, that they were more likely to also have uh, mental health symptoms. Um, there was also an, as an association with autistic traits from the parent reports. And one of the interesting findings was that when uh, the researchers looked at self reports from young people, the association was even stronger self reports as, a, uh, as opposed to reports uh, by their parents. And finally, I think one of the interesting things was that there was the absence of any clear evidence of a link with uh, sociodemographic characteristics. So in summary, there was some very useful information provided by this, uh, th this study. We have a large sam sample that are attempting to get the whole population um, and we're using validated mental health outcomes. Uh, the findings are very much consistent with, with the small number of, uh, of similar studies. Uh, and while we might have concerns about who takes part and who drops out of these studies, in the context of, of population cohort studies, this is a, a, a good follow up. Um, and perhaps the main limitation is more a recommendation for future research, thinking about how do we represent the range of gender diverse experience and, 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 and when, uh, if we're wanting to better understand how to support people. So here's my conclusion. I felt overall this was a well conducted population cohort study. We found the broad prevalence of any gender diverse experience was about 4.3%. Uh, and those experiences were associated with more mental health symptoms. Future research needs to address how we understand, how researchers represent and understand the diversity of that experience and, and, and how it evolves over time. So I'll pass you back now to the campfire and uh, we, can, we can continue with the discussion. Thanks for listening. Hi everyone, thank you for for paying attention to that. And I think it might be worth another thing which might relate to our, uh, oops, excuse me, my um, computer has started to play another video in the window. Um, uh, it was that it, the findings were consistent with other population studies that have been done at different periods of time and in different countries. 
Um, and I thought that was quite a potentially, and you know, it's interesting that we're 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 seeing these similar patterns over with research done at different time periods. Brilliant, thank you, Douglas. So, Akka, I wanted to give you a chance to kind of reply to this. Um, can you tell us first of all what you set out to achieve with this study, and and what was the answer you found, and what you you know was that surprising or what you expected? So the purpose of this study was, first of all, to go to the general population, look at gender variant experiences in the general population, because we have a large cohort, a longitudinal cohort that has been collecting data since 2002 in the Netherlands. So that was a great opportunity. And we ask uh, parents and questions repeatedly about, I mean, very limited dimension um, of gender variant experiences, but at least we have some information. That was also for us an opening to, um, to see how we can, you know, expand research in this area, in this population-based sample. So um, that was the really first step. Um, so that's why we, uh, we looked into the data. Uh, we, um, we had some ideas about, uh, for, uh, you know, about the prevalence experience expected prevalence because um, a similar study uh, with similar instruments in Germany, uh, one smaller one in the Netherlands, and also the large uh, cohort uh, in the United States, they reported a, a percentage between one to four percent, and we knew that we should expect around the same number. Uh, we also anticipated to see a positive correlation association between mental health outcomes and gender variant experiences. So we were not surprised to see that. Well, the strength of the association was, I mean, we were really, it was very convincing to see that a strong association, especially if we use a child report. So um, findings were expected. Yeah, I think it was remarkable. Just it was very consistent across all the different domains. That uh, so different different kinds of mental illness symptoms were were were, were consistently associated across the spectrum. Yeah. And I guess I'm interested in your thoughts on what research we need about mental illness incidence and prevalence in this group of young people or whether we should just focus on how we can actually help young people uh, who are gender diverse and have mental health problems. It feels like there's a lot of research which is highlighting the problem and the size of it rather than research which is focused on what we should be doing. Yeah, what's your thoughts on that, Agar, initially? I agree with you that we definitely need more research how we can help. But um, I think we still need more research on also the status of the, the problem and situation because um, we, we know very little. It's just that these data that I'm talking about, there are very few studies, limited in a few countries. As uh, Doug brought up, it's a very, um, follow-ups are very short. We don't know, you know, like we looked at kids between age 9, 10 to 13, 14, what happens next? Uh, we, there are not so many studies looking at longer follow-ups. Uh, we, we don't know why we see these, uh, these associations. That's another thing. Um, one way to help is if you really go and um, look for those root uh, uh, causes. You mentioned when at the beginning of the session, the, the distress, and that's one of the, the framework that we are working on, but um, we still need to work on that and uh, you know, create data. So I think we need um, research both on, you know, knowing more about the problem and also how we can help. Because I think if you, the more you know about the problem, the, the better, you know, you can guide your, your research on how you can help. Um, and of course, education and awareness is, is the beginning of that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. I'm going to turn to some of the questions that are coming in from the audience now. We're going to try and answer two or three of these. And then we're going to move on to broaden out the conversation a little bit. Um, so we've got a question here talking about mental health trusts in London. There's a debate about whether they should be providing specialist services for LGBTQ plus young people and families 
or whether all CAM services should be trained and understand how to offer a high quality service to gender diverse young people. Um, yeah, what do the panel think of this? Julio, do you want to answer that first of all? Yes, sure. I think that can be quite um, controversial, this, uh, this issue, because first, we, I think that we all agree that we need um, specific resources, or at least better uh, resources addressing that. But if we split uh, between what we understand as the regular or the current camps or referral pathway to mental health um, for non-conforming uh, conforming gender uh, young people or adults and conforming them that, that in a way um, could, I don't know, generate like some kind of segregation. And um, again, I think that we don't, I mean, we can't um, uh, forget that we are treating people regardless the gender uh, identity, regardless the, the sexual orientation, we should be able to provide the same level of, of care. The, when I was um, talking about specific training, the specific training would be mainly to consider the prior history of trauma, because we know that um, young people, LGTB uh, youth has, uh, has had uh, <clears throat> significant uh, significant stressful traumatic events so uh, we should be able to assess evaluate those to to be able to provide with the right support um maybe that requires a, a specific i don't know training on how to address trauma how to treat cbt but again regardless the orient the sexual orientation i don't think that we need to provide with an special uh, uh, care but it's sort of it's can be controversial, can be controversial. So I don't know I, if anyone has any any other input opinion on that. That's great, thank you. I'd like to move on and make sure we can cover a couple more questions because there's loads coming in. There's a question from somebody working in CAMS who regularly uses the RCADS scale. So this is the children's anxiety and depression scale. And, um, they say, unfortunately, to calculate these psychometrics, you must identify if a young person is male or female, and you cannot calculate for any other gender identity. I guess this is quite a common issue with these sorts of scales and checklists. Uh, they ask if, there is, if there's research or work going on around this. Uh, Akgar, do you want to say something? I mean, you might know about RCAD specifically or just broadly about making sure that these sorts of instruments are inclusive. Yeah, that's that's a very good point. I mean. Um, I, 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 first of all, I admit that in research, we use these instruments, these rating skills differently in clinical settings. So we don't really um, use um, gender specific, uh, you know, scores or anything in research settings. So that's why, we, we, that, I mean, that's one reason we feel safer to do that because uh, uh, we are looking for, you know, underlying differences and we, we don't want to push something. I understand in the clinical setting, it might be different. So my experience is um, using instruments and not really paying attention to, you know, what we we can say, you know, I don't know, gender specific norms or sex uh, or, or I mean, for many of them that exist, but we don't use them in research setting. Um, I don't know if I answer your question or I miss some part. <laughs> No, I think that's a fine answer. Thank you. It's a tricky question to answer, isn't it? And obviously science needs to catch up with what's going on in the real world. Yeah, absolutely. I think we are a little bit behind in the instruments that we are using. Uh, one of them was the limitation of our study that we use an instrument that only, you know, we had uh, one dimension of like, if you talk about gender varying experiences, you're thinking of gender identity, gender expression, you can uh, think of various dimensions you you for years we were just relying on instrument and ask are you identify as transgender yes no which you know unfortunately we're not using that anymore but we're still you know uh, we have a lot to do thank you there's a question here that I'd like to put to you Kit initially um, and I'm sure the other panelists might have a view on this as well but someone's asking if um, we know why more female born children associate with gender diverse experiences than male born children. This was a finding of Atgar's study. Have you got any ideas, Kit, on that? Um, yeah, I think it 
a lot of it comes down to how we're socialized as soon as we're born. I think people who are born female or, or identify with being a girl, it's more expected for them to be more emotional and more open about their feelings compared to boys or like um, male born people who are expected to kind of like puff it up and spread even from a young age even like unintentionally based off of what the parents do is kind of enforced by society still so i think that girls are able to explore their their gender um or female born people um more than uh male born children are um and i also think that female born children you know them exploring their gender is not as controversial as male born children are because when female born children are exploring their gender it's maybe doing more boy things being more tomboyish that's socially acceptable but a male born child doing stereotypically feminine things is more controversial i think and even today where it's a little bit more open but people still are like oh we can't wear dresses can't do that um, and I think that, you know, still female born children and people in general are, you know, allowed to express themselves and their emotions um, more, I don't know, differently. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. You're nodding at guys. Anything you want to add to that? Was that a surprising finding for you? Or? No, it wasn't surprising. Um, I, I mean, I can only speculate, but I agree with Kit. That's what I also think that might explain um also i also i mean i still don't know this is one of the instruments that we use as the question do you want to be treated as the opposite sex and i think that question the way it is asking even though it's a validated you know back to the issues with the instrument we have even though it's a validated instrument i feel uh, you know i i feel that does it matter what culture i'm coming from maybe i want to be treated like boys because they get better you know, more respect or better treatment in the society. I don't know. I mean, it's something, it's all a speculation, but that's also something that um, I thought when I saw the results. Yeah. Okay, so let's broaden that out a little bit now. Um, Julio, I want to start by asking you a bit about your clinical expertise. So it looks like there's this emerging science which tells us that there is a a link between gender diversity and mental health problems and you have a higher risk of mental health problems if you're gender diverse and that makes you know it seems logical yes um what does your clinical expertise tell us about that well as i, I just said it's quite quite logical because it's there you know the what we see in you know clinical uh, practice uh, almost uh, daily uh, LGTB youth uh, have much uh, much worse health outcomes, mainly because of the experience, the prior adversities, uh, stressful traumatic experience during during childhood and through uh, childhood. So uh, we need that. We know, sorry, that uh, they have um, a significant uh, and poorly, you know, also a set of traumatic events and which later on will uh, develop or at least will uh, take an uh, important uh, play in, in, the, in other mental health uh, difficulties, other anxiety, depression, sleep problems, uh, even, even you know, self-harming behavior. So we know that that link is, is there between ACE, uh, adversity, um, childhood experience being uh, part of or being a, a not gender conforming uh, um, kid or uh, being part of the LGBTQ community and developing other other um, difficulties mainly uh, regarding with the mood and depression is is quite quite high and as well as anxiety. So uh, we know that the link is there. And so we need to start um, working how to how to address uh, uh, those. And Akkar, do you think we're looking at the tip of the iceberg here? You know, my, my sense is with these sorts of cohort studies where it's self-report and people decide whether or not they're going to join in with them, 
it may be that we're excluding the very people who are most affected by these issues. And certainly the same may be true in mental health services. Young people may not be presenting because they're experiencing so much exclusion and stigma and discrimination. Is the problem bigger than we are estimating? I think you're absolutely right. But that's what we see that those are, for those participating are, we usually, you know, for, lose people that they really have problems because they're already dealing with a lot of challenges in their life and they don't have time for research. That is true. Uh, the other thing that I feel that sometimes we are missing things is that we, many of our instruments are relying on parents to tell us about kids. Uh, it is difficult to get information about young kids. Uh, we are getting better in that, you know, designing creative interviews to get information from kids, but still uh, um, it's most of the time we are relying on parents that at least our data shows that they might not know much about the, you know, what their kids are going through. And Kit, what's your thinking on the, the science telling us that, you know, there's a link here between gender diversity and mental health? What's your lived experience? perspective on that um yeah i would definitely say there is a link not a causal link that being gender diverse makes you mentally ill i think it's more about how um it's a kind of a two-parter there's one of you know your lived experience as a gender diverse person makes you more open to being excluded in society um struggle with interpersonal relationships because of how people treat you which like you know help make cause you to develop so like depression anxiety as a result um and it's also i think a lot of if you're exploring your gender you're looking very introspectively and if you're exploring your gender you're also going to think about what your mental health means to you and how you feel so you're going to be more open to kind of seeking help perhaps um of self-reporting that you've got certain conditions um so it's kind of like a a double-edged sword in that sense. <laughs> and do you think things have changed? You're saying that it's sort of six or seven years in your in your personal experience since you've had this kind of journey. Um, in that time, do you think the the sort of social changes that we've seen and the increased discussion about this is it, a double-edged sword, isn't it? Because you've got more conversation and more openness on the one hand, and then a lot more, you know hate and bullying and all sorts of stuff going on on social media on the other hand oh absolutely it's like a wonderful thing that there's more exposure but with more exposure you get exposure from people who don't understand don't want to understand and just want to see the negatives of it um, and that is damaging for especially in the uk where there's kind of this the transgender trend in schools and things like that that debate going around it can be quite damaging to young people um, because it makes them feel like you know they thought oh people are becoming more accepting of trans kids and stuff like that wonderful but then people are also critiquing that in a way that's not respectful um, it's quite harmful and it creates this kind of like really toxic kind of culture especially online on places like twitter and stuff like that um, where like people's lives are just being debated instead of just like having a healthy discussion about it um yeah. yeah thank you given that all that is going on um i just want to say thank you so much for joining us in this discussion it's, it's it's wonderful to have your views in here um i want to uh, try and answer another question um and apologies i'm not sure who's asked these questions so i can't say this comes from um you know sheila in birkenhead i'm not sure but um the question is about um, the going back to basics discussion that we had earlier on, talking about active listening and mutual respect. And the questioner is asking how we try and encourage this holistic approach over different services and organisations. Um, they say, I find this is something that is talked about, but not embedded. So how can we do this better? Julio, do you want to start off with some suggestions? Yeah, yes, yeah, true. Because I uh, I suggested that I made that uh, that comment, and it's true. It's quite easy, you know, to to say quite obvious uh, as I say earlier, um, but uh, it's not that straightforward sometimes to <laughs> to to implement. I will suggest, so I will say that from I mean from school, from you know from the education settings, um, 
talking from you know from a clinical perspective and also mental health professional uh, point of view during the training I think it's also very important. Uh, I uh, I didn't do my training in the UK, uh, uh, but um, we used to say that. Tell me where uh, you did your your your, your training, and I can uh, know what your orientation is in terms of using uh, therapy, pharmacology, treatment. So in a way, it's I mean it's quite it's quite true that if you during your training when you are like. Uh, growing when you are learning how uh, you have someone like a role also a clinical role that can teach you that can help you to improve all this uh, knowledge that can discover you all this uh, um, in a way it's gonna help much it, it's gonna make a huge difference the way that you approach and the way that you ask questions the way that you listen um, but yes yeah, so that it will be very difficult uh, to to maybe to put that or implement that in, across uh, nation across the country across all the uh, training programs, but uh, I think that education uh, will be the the main the main role for that. And Agar, what's your thinking about what the different? Oh, this is such a terrible question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. I'm interested in who does this well currently across mental health and education. Who are the people that have got these skills? Um, these active listening, mutual respect kind of skills. Who can we learn from in how to do this well with young people? I think primarily it's um, psychologists, psychiatrists working, child psycho psychologists, child psychiatrists who uh, who are doing uh, this, you know, who are mostly involved in those services. Um, at least I know in the United States. Um, I would argue that pediatricians shouldn't also know more about that because um, you know they some of sometimes they are the only encounter a child might get um, and the it's like child, child psychiatry services are not uh, widely available everywhere so um, that's why I think that we can do more training for pediatricians um, uh, in general. Uh, in the United States, others who are involved in the care are also um, endocrinologists uh, and, and, and other specialties like adolescent medicine is another ex um, you know, um, group of experts that they, um, at least in my institutions, um, they are the first uh, you know, encounter uh, for many of these kids. So, Thank you. Another question coming in here. I'm not sure who's um, best to answer this. It's what is the impact of ethnicity and culture in the development of gender diversity? Anybody want to come in on that? I guess I'm interested in, you know, a broader question, which is the kind of intersectional approach to being compassionate and non-judgmental in our care. Um, we're talking very much specifically about gender diversity and then we're talking about LGBTQ+, but what about the kind of intersectional lens on all of this? I, I The only comment I can have here is that we, I mean, we, I, we have very little data on gender development because the question specifically asks about gender development. We have very, we, our knowledge about gender development is very limited, so to begin with. But um, the reason that we, I personally, I wanted to do the study in the, United, in the Netherlands, and then my training was in the Netherlands, so that's why this data is coming from the Netherlands. And now I live in the United States. And the first question I get is that, is there a difference from the Netherlands to the US? Do you see differences? And I, that's why I, I really want to do the same thing in the United States to see what are the influences of the cultural factors and then, of course, you have to go beyond this um, few Western countries with well-designed studies. You have to really go look out for, for data in all over the world to see, to answer the question on the effect of culture on gender development. It's a very difficult question. Yeah, and I guess the broad picture is that the vast majority of research is done in high-income countries on white people. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a very hard question to answer with research. Yeah. Yeah, our, our, our cohort was uh, 
pretty diverse. <laughs> I, I, I did this research in the Netherlands in the city of Rotterdam, which I don't know how familiar you are with the city. It's not the typical Dutch city you have in mind. It's very diverse. Yeah, absolutely. Ethnically and yeah. diverse in terms of poverty and all sorts of other socioeconomic. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. OK, so we've got a few minutes left. I just want to bring it to a close now. I want to ask you all to answer this question very briefly at the end. Um, and I think it's about how we support professionals to adopt a more compassionate, a more non-judgmental approach towards gender diverse young people. What would your advice be to how we can try and do that better? Julio, do you want to go first? Yes, sure. I think that this kind of uh, um, webinars platform are really useful for that. Uh, not only because of your maybe professional background, uh, Akar and uh, myself, mostly because Kit is, is here. And I think that we need to learn from uh, with them and work alongside uh, uh, the path, you know, with, with them. And I think that this is a great learning learning experience. But training courses, uh, trying to get all all that um, learning resources from different, uh, even I don't know, medical or professional bodies. In my case, as a psychiatrist, the Royal College of Psychiatrists, or uh, any kind of organization, working together with association charities on how you know, how yeah, how to develop more more skills in addressing this, and also try to lose this um, kind of fear, fear sometimes when when asking questions. And, and and yeah, I think that again education learning uh, teaching uh, will be like the, the main tool yeah absolutely thank you Akka, what would you add to that um perhaps i the part that i really like about this session is the first time i'm attending so i'm very excited and uh, the way that that went over the you know how we can evaluate uh, you know the level of uh, you know how can we rely on evidence we see papers publishing headlines in newspaper, how can we evaluate that this is good quality and we can rely, you know, this is, this is very important because we're always bombarded with information every day and we, we are looking for, you know, what is true and we, we can learn how we can really evaluate. And if we look out for the evidence, good quality evidence, then, you know, we can educate ourselves, not expect others to educate us. Absolutely. So better training in services, co-production of services, better access to high quality evidence for CAMS professionals. Yeah, absolutely. Kit, I want you to, I'll give you the last word. What would you like to see in terms of support for CAMS professionals to do all this stuff better? Um, I would probably just like to see, again, continuing to having these open discussions. Um, and having a you know a variety of different opinions because I think having someone there who they can consult who's experienced that is extremely valuable in all sense not just in terms of gender diversity um, I think listening to people in the community talking with them having open non-judgmental conversations people of different ages is incredibly important um, and I think you know if you're going to put any kind of services in place or legislation, you do need to talk to the people that it's going to affect the most. Um, and there's plenty of groups who are willing to speak about it and open about their experiences. So that's really valuable. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Everyone on the panel, our brilliant group of organisers and all you lovely people in the audience. Much appreciated. Find out more about becoming an ACAM member and to be part of the advancement of child and adolescent mental health, visit www.acamh.org.